I'm titling today's talk, Five Worship Ministry Trends You Can't Ignore. And this is the, the talk that I really like to give to frame everything that Church Run is and, and, and it's what we're about and what we're doing, how we help equip folks. And um, I give it this title because I'm also kind of an internet marketer and I gotta like pique your curiosity somehow. So hopefully that works, right? So these things, maybe you've heard some me talk about these things in different YouTube videos before. There are other trainings floating around online, but this is kind of my most up-to-date version of this. Like if you're a new worship leader, which I know we got some like interns in here and stuff like that. Um, and then we've got some, even people who've been in for a while, um, just good reminders. I'm, I'm preaching to myself up here when I'm talking about this stuff. But hopefully this talk can kind of frame everything that we're gonna cover today and tomorrow for you guys and help you understand the reasoning of why um, we, we do gatherings like this, we make the courses that we do, we, um, and then you know, we make the YouTube videos that we do because they all kind of fa fall into these five different categories. So this is, in all this, what I'm about to share with you is kind of, it's coming from this, this is my, my story and my experience. And I'll, I'll make sure I kind of pull from that as we work through these things. So I've been leading worship since I was 16, 17 years old. Now I'm 40, not 40, 31 years old. I know I look, my hair looks like I'm 41. Um, but uh, yeah, 14 years of leading worship. And then we've been doing this church front thing for like more than about five years. And I've, I, it's crazy. When you look on the YouTube channel in the Vimeo in Wistia library, we have like a thousand plus videos of me being in front of a camera talking about worship ministry. So just the amount of volume of videos we've made. So, and we've also been helping a lot of people figure out how to lead worship. And here's my secret. Along the way, I'm still figuring out how to lead worship too, okay? So now, I'm not saying these things like I've got it all figured out, right? Um, but these are the people, these are the different customers around the globe that we've had at Churchfront or Worship Ministry School. So someone bought a course or Churchfront pads or um, Worship Ministry School stuff. And it's cool to see like, there's some place like this island. What is this island right here? I, I don't even know. Or this island right here. This actually looks like a couple people from there. But it's just fun to see the, like, it's reaching people globally. Um, and then we've had 14 million views. So we're getting data too about like what worship ministries want to learn about. Like what are the, the hot topics people are trying to, to figure out, right? Because those things get the most views, click through, watch time, all that stuff. 1.3 million watch time hours. It'd be interesting to see like what the, how many years that is, that, that amount of time but I do not have it figured out, um, all out. And this is one thing I was chatting with Adam a couple weeks ago. And, and sometimes, you know, when, when you're an online creator, you, you see the, the best and worst of, of humanity in our comment sections of videos, right? And it's, it's like, and most, most of the time, it's the worst part of humanity that's the most vocal about things. And it's always kind of the common theme of like, you know, I guess it's kind of pride or arrogance. And that's where I just like want to encourage us all, remind us all, including our, myself, like we don't have it all figured out when it comes to knowing the best tips, tricks, tools, strategies. And like one of the biggest takeaways you could have from, from this talk is just, just that's the one thing you can be certain about is that you don't know it all. So that's, a, that's one thing that I'm very certain about. But I've noticed these trends over the past few years and kind of where we're headed, especially if you want to build a thriving worship ministry and not necessarily just kind of a mediocre uh, ministry. So five worship ministry trends you can, can't ignore. Number one, churches want pastors, not just song leaders. Churches want pastors, not just song leaders. And the same could be said, not just a mix engineer, right? I know there's a lot of you, some of you are worship leaders, some of you are tech directors. This is for all of you out there. Um, and 
We, we need pastoral leadership, especially in, in worship ministry roles. And here's what that kind of looks like. I mean, at least here's my journey. I can only kind of speak for, for how I've um, handled these five trends that I'll be talking about and have kind of navigated them over, over the years. So the first is like taking time to like learn theology, right? Like actually taking time to sit down and learn it because there's so many great resources out there, so many great books to read that help you understand the Bible better. You can understand systematic theology, historical theology. These are very, they can be very boring. They can actually be fascinating too. Like some people like Zach kind of really dig those things, right? But, uh, you know, and I did, I did for a season. I think we all go through different seasons. But for me, that season was college because college, I was really into music, trying to develop myself as a worship pastor. And then I kind of, I stumbled across um, Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach, that guy's face that's on the screen. And I learned that even though he was the best of the best musician, he was also a very good theologian. And he, he viewed like, he had to be just as good of a theologian as he was a worship music director. Um, so he really, you know, the guy did all the studying in the world to, to make sure that he understood all these theological concepts that he was then, you know, composing music around. Um, because it's important to learn theology because as worship leaders, we're singing, praying, and teaching theology, right? That's what we're doing on a week-to-week -week basis. And it's hard to do that, to sing, sing theology. I mean, there's some great songs out there. So if you're singing these songs like King of Kings, like we just sang, it's like, they, they're writing some great theology in there. But as a worship leader, we wanna be obviously theologically informed as we go about selecting these songs and shaping our services, right? And then when we're praying, we also wanna be praying right theology, gospel-centered theology. And then we wanna be teaching it. I, I, I had this paradigm shift probably late college, going into seminary, um, especially because I was in the Anglican church denomination at that time. And there's a lot of great, you know, tradition that's in there and practices that they have, but you, you've got to like be able to explain to people what's going on for that to really have much, much meaning or context um, for them, you know, and you don't have to explain it every time, but everything that we do in, as worship leaders on a Sunday morning, we got to take time to be able to actually teach our congregation um, because yeah, our pastor is going to spend 35, 40 sometimes way too long teaching our uh, congreg congregants, um, you know, in a normal sermon uh, situation. But as worship leaders, like we kind of get to do the same, but we get to have music and, you know, the cool transitions and all the audiovisual support there. I, I think it's more fun, to be honest. But uh, that's why we get to learn theology, because we sing, pray, and teach theology. And then the third thing, is we obviously have to be living our right theology. Uh, this is probably, could actually go be number one, right? It's like, if you don't have the character and the heart right, it's all pointless um, and you're not gonna get far. So, and there's, you know, the Bible is full of passages and different virtues and, you know, where we can get pretty clear pictures of what it looks like to, to live as new creations and um, to follow in the ways of Christ, right? So Philippians 2, five through eight, the ultimate picture of humility. Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So it's hard, if we're all honest, like, when you're in, a lead, you're in a leadership position at a church and your job is to um, get on stage every week and you know, lead excellent music and sing, play your instrument or whatever, and you're, you're, you're facilitating this time, which also can just, it's just really impactful for people, right? And it's easy to let that get to our head, especially if you are doing a great job and people are giving you so much positive feedback, but you just gotta be careful and you can't, um, you can't let pride creep in there, whether it's from a kind of good reasons, like you're doing well at your job, as well as um, maybe some not so good reasons. Like we've also been there leading week in and week out and there's the criticism that comes, even though we have 
completely pure hearts as we're approaching this job. We're not trying to offend anyone or upset anyone about how loud the music is or a certain song we picked or anything like that. But the criticism, it's always going to come. Um, sometimes uh, you, you probably should be more concerned if there's, there's no criticism um, sometimes. So, um, and you have to approach that with humility and you know, let, let people say their thing, whatever that is, and, uh, and respond in a loving way. And I think humility and service obviously come hand in hand because there's certain aspects of our job that it's not fun to do, um, whether that's serving, like serving your worship ministry. Like I always like to, or serving your band, I like to treat my band members like they're the professional rock stars that they just show up, plug in, and they're ready to go, right? Like that's, it kind of takes service, uh, a service mindset or mentality there uh, instead of thinking that, uh, no, they can take care of themselves. Like, I'll just focus on my thing. So humility and service, love. Again, this is living the right theology. Just the way we handle um, anything. A good example of this is that my wife will say, she, she it was funny because she's like, she saw what I was talking about today. She's like, you have to include more stories of yourself that are self-deprecating so people will like you more. Okay, <laughs> I will. So of her example here, it's just like, how to love people better, you know, I'm, when I'm leading on Sunday morning, I'm such a, if you guys can't tell, like, I'm gonna just get it done and, like, let's focus on the thing and just get it done and, like, get it done right. And, you know, I'll be playing there and then I'll hear a nice, interesting chord from the pianist who sometimes my wife, and then I just look back at her and give her, like, the, the, the stare, right, or the glare, and it's not very loving, um, not a very, because it's not going to accomplish anything good, right? It could be my wife, could be anybody else in the band, could be passive aggressive comments to your sound guy or whatever. Um, it's just not, it's not going to help you accomplish anything good. Um, so our ministry needs to be saturated with the actual love of Christ. And then a willingness, again, living theology is to actually a willingness to put in the work. Whatever you do, work heartily, ask for the Lord and not for men, we really do have one of the greatest responsibilities, callings, job, whatever you want to call it, um, and we got to do it like we mean it, um, with 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 passion, and like actually be willing to like. Sometimes that means, I don't know. In my life, that's meant staying at the church until 1 a.m. figuring out how to patch our new digital mixing console. I've been there. That that was before church front existed. <laughs> Um, hopefully I can help you guys not be there, but you know, it's, I still loved it. I didn't want to be anywhere else, right? Like it was um, because I, I just love this type of stuff. So learn theology, sing, pray, and teach theology, live theology because churches want pastors, not just song leaders. And I don't want you guys to end up on the Babylon Bee. <laughs> All right, so that's trend Number one of five. Worship leader commits 47 heresies in 30-second prayer. So don't be that guy. <laughs> oh, man. I feel like you could give a whole talk. Maybe I'll do that next time. I'll use all Babylon B headline and articles. And you could, you could learn a lot for, about worship ministry that way because <laughs> they pick on us all the time. All right, number two. Worship teams want order, not chaos. Worship teams want order, not chaos. Okay, let's get down to brass tacks, whatever that means. Um, some of y'all are gonna lose your job if you don't get organized. Um, so yeah, I'm just saying, like we, we've heard this from pastors a lot. We get, we talk to a lot of like, so worship leaders reach out and sometimes lead pastors reach out. And then we hear something like this. He or she's got a great heart, they're a skilled musician, anointed leader, but the lack of preparation, um, I don't know why I put an and in there, but it is driving us mad. Um, so I, I get it. You know, there's a lots of moving parts in worship ministry. You've got planning the liturgy, you've got music, music, you've got the technology, you've got the team management, and it's kind of like, a juggling act, trying to get that going. And especially like if you're amazing, gifted, you know, creative artists, right? Um, and you love, you're great at, you know, leading songs and, and 
all that, all that stuff, right, that happens on the platform. But if the behind the scenes stuff isn't getting done and you're not creating an environment of order for your worship ministry, uh, for your team members, like it's gonna drive them insane and they're, they're gonna wanna opt out. Um, so the good news is we do have more tools than, than ever today, like to make it ri- ridiculously simple to be able to keep everything organized, right? You've got Planning Center, you've got Google Suite, you've got Asana. A lot of it though, you do need the actual drive, inward drive to actually use those tools and take the time to use them. But I still think, you know, if you have that, if you have the mindset of like, oh, I'm just not the creative type or whatever personality, it's like, well, sometimes you gotta, you gotta let the Lord kind of shape your personality um, if you really wanna have longevity in ministry. Actually, I feel like every day we should let the Lord be shaping our, our personality. So we want order, not chaos. And I think the best illustration for this was, this is the front yard of our house a few months ago. It's horrible. It was like chaos to the max. Like this hasn't, hadn't been touched for like 20 years or something like that. And it's just like, it's complete chaos, right? And this is how I feel about like if my ministry, if, if my planning center is, is, is out of whack, like charts aren't really organized or my Ableton stuff isn't organized or our sound console, I don't know where things are patched in or um, I don't have, you know, standard operating procedures of checklists of how to, you know, fire everything up on Sunday to make sure we don't miss anything. I think we have like 35 steps on our checklist now. Um, but it's great because we use a checklist and we don't forget it. And it brings order because I would like to think, Aaron, I think, I think this is correct, but the vibe I've gotten, gotten from team members is like they actually enjoy being here. And it's like when they show up on Sunday, everything's ready to go. It's, uh, maybe most things are ready to go. Maybe there's a little tweak or something. It's a little bit of troubleshooting, but it just makes Sunday so enjoyable. I love it. The team loves it. So when you get things in order, here's the after of the pretty f- landscape, right? And this is like actually a very, uh, order is a very theological thing too, right? You get this from the creation narrative in Genesis. Like God gives us the raw materials. We get to join him in the, the creative process and all the work that we get to do, right? It's kind of a theology of work. Um, and you see it in landscaping, but I also believe we see that in, in worship ministry, bringing order to chaos. And the other thing, though, is the chaos, it's, it's going to keep coming. Uh, it's always going to try to keep coming back. So you're going to constantly be bringing things back to, back to order. Um, like we, that tech booth back there, you know, we try to we keep it clean, and then random things show up, and they go in the dumpster. So we're just trying to maintain order. All right, that's number two. Number three, savvy production will not make up for a sloppy musicianship. Yeah, got a woo over here. Because it's like, we do have lots of great production tools. Um, you guys, I love talking about all the production tools out there. That's why a lot of you probably found Church Run, whether it's, you know, auto-tune, live auto-tune on your vocals or all the processing and mixing that we can do with our digital mixing consoles. Um, oh, I meant to, to have that meme. I forgot to put it in my slides, but the meme where it's like a video where the guy is like going crazy mixing in a studio and then there's, you hear like beautiful music from this pop star and then it switches to her room where she's recording and it's just like, it's like really horrible. Um, and it's just like showing like what mix engineers really do. Um, it's kind of, it is kind of true. I mean, you can do a lot these days, but uh, as worship ministry leaders, worship leaders, Um, And again, I'm also making a case for like, if someone's behind a mixing console, you gotta have solid uh, musicianship in place as well. So taking time to learn things like music theory, the boring music theory. Um, I like to say, if you spend, you know, if you just do the first two semesters of music theory from college, that's really all you need for the rest of your life. Especially if you're already a talented musician, Man, if you learn music theory, it's going to make your life so much easier managing your band and, and resourcing them. And then music technology. It's kind of a blend of all the tech we've got, but it's in a musical format. You got all these DAWs out there that we're learning, Ableton, Logic, Pro Tools, all the plugins. Um, 
understanding MIDI keyboards, talk to the, the Sunday C's, uh, Sunday Keys, <laughs> Sunday C's, Sunday Keys team about that, right? They're all about music, music and technology and that intersection there. And then good old fashioned practice and memorize. You'll be amazed what, <laughs> it's so funny. I've done this before, you know, it's like even, I'm sorry, Aaron, sometimes today where it's like, I'll, I'll, I'm leading worship here and Sunday comes and the rehearsal's the first time I've actually like, I've actually rehearsed the songs. So I apologize, forgive me, Aaron. Sometimes that happens. Um, but I, when you're doing it for 14 years, you can, you can kind of, you know, it's easier to fake it till you make it. But man, if I put in just 20 minutes to 30 minutes, especially if I come in here, now I have that luxury to like run through my set, actually practice the songs, actually memorize the songs so I can be looking at my congregation members instead of staring at that cheat screen up there. Um, way better experience. It's amazing what 20 to 30 minutes of that can do um, every week. And this gets easier if you spent more time in here. Um, yeah, really the music theory part, but... Um, in my musical journey, it looks different for everyone. So here's, uh, here's Jake back when I was a fifth grader with my, my Slammer Hammer bass. That was my first bass guitar. And um, I, I, that's where I started, bass guitar. And then you guys, I don't even know why I'm showing this, but handbells. <laughs> you guys, I played, I played at the International handbell symposium in, in uh, Orlando, Florida, Florida back in, um, it was like 2008, 2009. I was at a small Christian school. This is what we had going for us. But man, you learn so much about music theory by playing handbells because you get your two notes you got to take care of. And then we're playing some pretty complex stuff. And then look at this. I combined bass guitar with handbells. So this was, uh, it was cool. It was like the uh, the Carol of the Bells rock and roll version. Who does that song? Um, which one? Yeah, Trans-Siberia Orchestra. It was their arrangement of this song. So my buddy Zach and I, um, he's from my garage band. You know, that, again, I kept, kept learning, developing musically. And then this was our garage band. Same, that's Zach. And it's literally in my parents' garage at their house. Those are uh, probably around 16 then. And then that, this is when around I, I started getting into worship music, leading worship at our church. This is one of our worship concerts. It's so funny to look at the, the lighting truss and like just the funny stuff there. That's my brother on drums, my sister on bass, uh, me on guitar, ex-girlfriend on vocals. <laughs> so, so it's just so, man. And then college came. That's where like I really took music seriously. That's me conducting our choir, um, a cappella choir. It's like as traditional as you can get. Like there's, yeah, who knows what videos are, are flowing around online of, of those days. And then now, now today, right? So to me, to get to the place where I finally feel com confident, competent as a worship musician, it like took that journey for me. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say like I said, you know, savvy production will not make up sloppy musicianship. And with musicianship, it's simply just putting in the time, putting in the reps for a long time. I mean, at least for, for people who aren't naturally uh, uh, savants or whatever, whatever you call it, <laughs> like myself. Um, but it should give you hope because if you actually learn theory, get some voice lessons, get some guitar lessons, and you can put the time in, some awesome stuff is gonna happen. Um, number four. Trend number four, technology is here to stay, adapt, or get left behind. So this is uh, no surprise to be hearing this from me, right? You guys hear about me and tech all the time. Whether it's audio, you know, it's, we're just at a place now where I, I just, yeah, if, if, if you're going to be leading a worship ministry, especially at a small to mid-sized church where you are in charge of the whole ministry, like, You've got to understand these things. And the good news is it doesn't mean you have to go spend four years at a, at a higher education to be a mix engineer. Like, you can make a ton of progress in these areas within just a few weeks to months, at least understanking the 20% the the, the that's going to get you the 80% results, right? Um, lighting and presentation, that's another huge area to be able to handle what's going on 
with, with our screens and how to get lighting right because that's important because now we're live streaming and if you're gonna be using cameras, you gotta make sure your lighting is, is working well and it looks good. And then even things like networking, um, this is probably this is probably one of the final frontiers for, for myself. It's just like, now I have to be an IT networking guru to like get these dang computers to keep talking to each other or get Dante working and stuff like that. So, um, and then of course, cameras. Um, for me, that was being a freelance videographer, YouTuber. Now we're doing a lot of broadcast stuff, but these are all very, you know, essential tools for modern day worship leaders, especially with what happened last year. And this was funny. I, you know, this is why Church Run exists, right? Because this whole adapt with the new technology, it's not necessarily easy. There's not a whole lot of guides out there. So this was the first YouTube video I found on my first blog post at Church Run back in March of 2016. I was at South Suburban Christian Church just down the road. And I was so excited because I figured out how to use Ableton Live for like the first time and how to start automating things. And I made this channel, Worship Production Tools. It has uh, no subscribers. And it was a horrible iPhone video. And uh, yeah, that was like the, the, the beginnings of what, what's now, now church front. So it was funny, like, but I was so excited that for like the feeling of getting technology to work for the ministry, so here the lights were automated, the lyrics were automated, and uh, it, just, it just felt magical. So that's why, that right there is why everybody is, is here today. So um, and God's grace along, along the way for sure. So this does not mean you need to spend multi-six figures on an AVL system. Um, and it does not mean that you have to copy the style or trend of uh, style of trend-setting mega churches, right? Like you don't have to be a Red Rocks. You don't have to be Elevation or Bethel or one of those. Like you gotta be you, be your church, right? What's appropriate for you? Like this is South, like don't be South, but this works well for us. Do I wanna spend another $100,000 on this room? Yes, but will we? No, right? Because we don't need to. It's, a, it's complete overkill. Um, I think that's one thing I've like, being in both the ministry world and also kind of the business world, I, I think a lot about capital allocation, right? I have to think about what's actually a wise investment and like, I don't know. Unfortunately, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of churches that like, I love technology, but they're allocating far more capital than they probably need on their systems. And, but then there's also a lot of churches who don't allocate enough. So it's finding that sweet spot of what's, what's right for you. Uh, what this does mean is you need to have a working knowledge of audio, visual, computer, and broadcast systems. No pressure. You need to get out of your comfort zone. So even if you're like, oh, I'm not techie. Well, you, you can learn it, you know? Um, you got your smartphone, you learn that, and you can, you can learn these other tools as well. Um, you should be more confident in yourself. Uh, Technology is here to stay, adapt, or get left behind. And then finally, trend number five. Worship teams need a leader. Lead. And here's what that looks like. Leaders know their team. They take time to know names, what their team members do for work, their family situation, what's going on in their lives. Leaders set standards, and they, yeah, they set standards not by just saying them, but actually, like, living them out, whether that's how prepped you are for a service, um, character and attitude, how you're carrying yourself when you're, when you're leading the team, when you're leading on Sunday, the energy levels. Leaders challenge their team. Um, you get pushback from team members or maybe, maybe you see, a, maybe a team member is more um, just not, you see they have more potential um, than what they're, what they're giving, I guess you could say. And it's, it's responsible of a leader to help draw out that potential. Um, and then this is another one, just dis distinguishing between communication versus consensus. It's important as a leader to be really good at communication and you gotta over communicate expectations and things like that. And, but sometimes I've had a lot of conversations with worship leaders or tech team leaders they, they feel like their job is, is consensus. Like 
okay, this is, a, this is the where we need to bring our ministry. So that means I need to go back to my team and make sure everybody is 100% on board with cons- like complete consensus and there's no pushback, right? Then we can move forward. Well, it's like, but of course they're never gonna find that. There's always gonna be someone who's gonna push back because of their discomfort. They're not comfortable with taking the ministry in a new direction, whether that's implementing this tech or whether that's, hey, we're gonna get rid of uh, music stands or something like that, right? Like, but it's, it's, a, it's the job of the leader to just communicate the why, the expectation, um, be available to communicate like, hey, how can I help you uh, move forward in this? You know, not to just be the person who's gonna always achieve consensus and so we can all like sing, sing Kumbaya all day and just be happy, right? Um, you, gotta, you gotta have those uncomfortable talks with your team members. Uh, leaders also work themselves out of a job. So always making yourself replaceable. Um, whether, yeah, that's anything in your ministry. Like you don't wanna be the only person who can do every single thing in your ministry, whether that's leading songs, running tech, anything else, work yourself out of a job. Uh, leaders make other leaders. In your other, uh, your, your direct reports, if they're healthy and hopefully they know how to lead too, they'll be very happy that you are producing other people who can do these things, especially when you wanna take a break, go on vacation, it's not gonna be a train wreck. Worship ministry, it's like so much more complex than like, you know, a pastor gets to just, pastors have a lot more stuff going on too. I wouldn't want their job. But on Sunday morning, they come up and they talk, right? It's just like, but with worship ministry, there's like 12 uh, moving parts or a lot more than 12, lots of moving parts. Um, And it's harder for us to like pull ourselves away from that and uh, have everything run smoothly. So again, it's important to replace ourselves, make other leaders. That's trend number five. Worship teams need a leader. So step it up and lead. Man, perfect timing, right? At 929. Those are my five worship ministry trends that you can't ignore if you wanna build and grow a thriving worship ministry this year, now in 2021 and, and beyond, I think in the years to come. And these are really the, the five pillars that we cover in our, in our program. Um, the five pillars we're already producing content around a church front, the five pillars that kind of frame the speakers that I invited to come talk today. Um, speak, like these are the, the pillars that are your pastoral responsibility as a worship ministry leader, the administrative and organization responsibility as a worship ministry leader, musicianship, technology, building and leading your team. So those are the, the five trends. Don't ignore them. Put the time and effort into them. Grow yourselves, develop yourself uh, in those areas. And I'm excited to hear, again, like how you'll grow in those areas from, from our talks that are gonna happen later today uh, and tomorrow. And that's all I have. That's, sorry, it's such a kind of a rough landing of the plane there. But if you wanna explore what that looks like to work through these areas and adapt to these trends uh, with my team, then connect with me, connect with Eric or Luke and one of our team members and let us know we've got our accelerator program um, that walks you through all of that through the courses and the coaching. So that's all I have for you guys. Um, Don't have a good day. Have a great day. We would love for you to join us at our next Church Front Live gathering. Go to churchfrontlive.com to see our schedule of upcoming events and register today.